All right, so I started the recording and uh, welcome once again to this webinar. So this is the first webinar in the Westgrid series this fall. Uh, my name is Alex Razumov. I'm a training and visualization coordinator with Westgrid. And today we're going to talk about NumPy, uh, sorry, about X-Array. So we're going to start with NumPy, but then we're going to jump very quickly into X-Array. And we'll talk about working with uh, multidimensional data inside X-Array. So in this presentation, I assume basic familiarity with NumPy arrays. And I realize that there are probably people here who are not familiar with NumPy, who don't really have a working knowledge of NumPy. So I'm gonna spend the next few slides talking about the basic NumPy functionality and uh, why they're, they're so great. And then we're gonna to jump, to, to jump to X arrays. So Python is a uh, interpreted language. Uh, so that means that when you run the code in Python, every line of code is converted to machine code on the fly. And in Python, uh, all variables are dynamically typed. So that means that when you uh, define a new variable, you don't really define its type. You simply assign a value to a variable. And then uh, from its value, the Python interpreter will deduce its type. And for any variable, you can actually change its type on the fly. So for example, you can say x is equal to five is gonna be integer, and then I can say x is equal to, in quotes, hello, and it's gonna be a string variable. So that may, this makes Python uh, really, uh, convenient, uh, programming Python really convenient. Uh, on the other hand, it makes it quite slow because a Python will need to check for the type of every variable in every line where it encounters the variable. And so it makes things uh, very slow. So Python also does not provide a mechanism, built-in mechanism for uniform uh, collection of uh, uh, variables. So by a uniform, I mean fixed type and fixed size in memory. So of course, you know that there are things like lists, uh, dictionaries, et cetera, et cetera, in Python, but uh, lists can be uh, non-uniform. So for example, you can have a list, a single collection, where the first number could be integer, second number could be real, third number could be string, fourth number could be another list and so on. So this makes Python uh, really, well, convenient uh, uh, but, and, and nice. And so this is a very high level programming language, but it also makes things uh, very, very slow because Python has to check the type of every element and then to access a certain element, you actually have to, when you, when you have this long list of let's say million elements, then it also has to store the offset in memory. So the memory address of each element. And this just makes things really, uh, really slow. So uh, fortunately, uh, there is a library called NumPy that provides a mechanism in Python, well, for Python, for uh, uniform collections. So you can have a collection of fixed size, fixed type uh, items. For example, all, in the, all elements are integer numbers or all elements are float numbers. Uh, so NumPy is not limited to numbers. You can actually have, you know, strings, for example. The point here is that if you have a NumPy array of strings, all elements have to have exactly the same number of characters. So it's fixed size. When you define an NumPy array, you set its, uh, uh, the size of each element and the type of each element. And so this makes a uh, NumPy array really fast because it's all compiled code. So the NumPy library is pre-compiled and all uh, types are static. So once you initialize an array, it's not gonna change its type. It's, it's static in memory and all el elements have exactly the same uh, type. And uh, NumPy arrays behave very differently from Python lists. So for example, when you have two NumPy arrays and you add them together, it will actually uh, do the element by element operation, right? So these two arrays usually have to, they don't have to, to be exactly the same, um, uh, same size, but if you have two arrays of the same size, then NumPy uh, will simply, uh, if you say A uh, plus B and A and B are NumPy arrays, then, uh, well, Python NumPy will simply add each element so perform an element-wise operation. So the first element of the result is gonna be A, A1 plus, well, A0 plus B0. Uh, next element is A1 plus B1 and so on. So uh, NumPy implements universal or vectorized functions on a large number of elements. So that means that uh, if you have, if you wanna um, apply the same function, the same operation to a large number of uh, you know, numbers, uh, then NumPy is probably the best way to do this because it's really fast. So it's all statically typed, it's all uh, compiled code. So it's gonna you know, perform a lot faster than if you were to do a, a for loop in Python. And you, know, you can get uh, speed up from a factor of 100 for a simple one dimensional array to, you know, I can show you an example uh, towards the end of this talk where I talk about uh, GeoData. Right here, I'm gonna uh, show a live demo. And uh, there I can actually give you an example where, you know, 
you get a speed up of by a factor of 10,000 by going from uh, several nested loops uh, to a NumPy uh, operation. Uh, so uh, in NumPy, you can also have um, operations on arrays that have different sizes and shapes. Uh, so NumPy implements a series of rules called broadcasting to modify uh, the size and the shape of individual arrays. So they actually become of the same uh, shape and size. And I have a slide on that uh, very soon. And then of course, finally NumPy, uh, because it provides, um, uh, it provides uh, numerical arrays, it also provides operations, uh, well, linear algebra operations on uh, these numerical arrays. So things like linear solve, inverse, dot products, obviously various decompositions, things like eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and so on. So I'm going to uh, spend the next few slides just showing you several examples. And then, so this is NumPy, the stuff that many of you already know, and then we're going to jump to X-Array. But I think this stuff is important. So those of you who have never seen this before, it's, it's good to take a look at this. So here I initialize a very simple array, which is one dimensional array. So np.arrange is a function in NumPy that simply initializes an array of integer numbers from zero to nine. So here I print this array, you see what it is. And then I can actually I perform an operation, so I'm going to say e, the entire NumPy array, um, uh, asterisk, asterisk, so that's to the power of two, so calc uh, compute the square of each element, and uh, you see that Python simply prints back the, uh, the array, so the result is also one-dimensional array of the same size, where each element is simply the square of the original array. And you can also perform uh, more complex mathematical functions like trigonometric functions, logarithms, et cetera, et cetera. So when you apply these functions to the array, uh, this, this function is essentially applied to each element of the array. So the only trick here is that uh, you can, for this, you can't really use um, the math library. You have to use the functions, mathematical functions from the NumPy library. And as you can see here, the same function is applied to each element of this array. And in the same uh, expression, you can actually uh, mix several arrays. Uh, so in this case, we have uh, two, well, three copies of the same array. So I'm simply forming a mathematical expression. I'm saying a squared plus e, and all of that is divided by a plus one. And if you pay close attention to this mathematical formula, you will see that this simply uh, evolves to uh, a floating version uh, copy of a, right? So a squared plus e divided by a plus one is simply e, where each element is now a floating uh, copy of the original integer element. And a floating copy because, well, for mathematical operations and in Python 3, all mathematical operations on, well, multiplication and, uh, sorry, <laughs> division, especially division of, um, of two integers will, will produce a floating uh, floating point number. And in this example, we have uh, two uh, NumPy arrays of the same size. Uh, so the guy in the, uh, uh, in the numerator has um, tile elements going from uh, zero to nine and uh, the, the element in, so the uh, array in the um, uh, denominator has 10, uh, sorry, uh, 10 elements going from uh, one to 10. And as you can see, uh, you simply uh, form a new uh, one-dimensional array of 10 elements where the first element is zero by one, then one by two, two by three, and so on. So uh, whenever possible, please, uh, in your Python code, uh, please replace uh, for loops, uh, try to replace for loops with uh, operations on NumPy arrays as a whole. If you're processing, you know, the same, uh, you're doing the same, performing the same operation on a large number of elements, and this simply will speed up calculations by a large factor. So in this case, let's just compute the uh, following sum. So k goes from one to infinity, and when k is large, well, when we have a large number of terms, that should become very close to six, and Doing this in NumPy is really very easy. We simply say k is an array because uh, it goes from one to a large number. So let's just take the first 10 terms, uh, a range from one to 11. So that's the first 10 terms. And then we simply uh, perform an operation on this array. So each element, k is replaced by uh, k squared divided by two to the power of k. And then you just sum up all operations. So this entire, you know, this entire, what I highlighted here in yellow is the uh, entire, you know, code in Python. Uh, and it simply uh, gives you the sum of uh, those first 10 terms of this uh, series. If you want to increase the number of elements, well, let's say instead of doing the first 10 elements, you want to do the first 50 elements, well, simply change 11 to 51, and then you get a number much closer to six. And of course, if you keep increasing this number, you will get into an error very quickly. And that is because uh, in uh, these NumPy operations, you have in the uh, denominator, you have an addition number to the power or two to the power of k. And very soon you run out of precision for uh, 64 bits, so eight byte uh, integers. And that's why you have essentially you know, zero 
uh, for very large uh, k uh, greater than 75 or so. And that's why I have division by zero. But it's very easy to correct this problem. So here, all you need to do is just switch from an energy operation to a floating operation. And then uh, the result of this operation is going to be a floating point array. And uh, you'll be good. So you'll get a number that is really, really close to six. And then uh, finally, I want to talk about broadcasting rules. So the idea here is that in the same expression, you can uh, mix arrays of different sizes and different, uh, well, different shapes and different dimensions. And NumPy will try its best uh, to perform an operation. And then uh, if it's possible, then we'll do it. If not, then it will give you an error. So I'm going to show you a few examples you know, on this slide. So the rules are, uh, you know, hard coded. Uh, they are given on, on this slide. So the idea is that if uh, there's an array with few dimensions, then uh, other array or another array or the other arrays, uh, then uh, this uh, low dimensional array is padded with ones on the left. And then any array with shape equal to one in the dimension is stretched to match the other array, array shape. And then if there is still disagreement, then you will get an error. And if not, then NumPy will perform a mathematical operation. So in NumPy, this is called broadcasting rules. Here's an example. Let's say we have two arrays, A and B. And A is a one-dimensional array, so it just it has three uh, elements. And then B also has three elements, but it's a two-dimensional array. So think of it as a vertical uh, vector. So it has three rows and one, one column, whereas A has uh, three, essentially it's a single row and has three, uh, three columns. So you see A is a horizontal vector and then B is a vertical vector, right? So when you try to compute things like A plus B, you have a mismatch in dimensions. So what NumPy will do, it will pad the one dimensional array with ones on the left, and then it will try to convert uh, that ones uh, to a uh, something else to a different number to match the size of the other array B. So in this case, everything works perfectly because uh, all uh, NumPy needs to do is just duplicate that row of E's into, well, the first row into copy it into the second row and then third row. So you have a three by three array uh, E and then it's uh, simply added to the array B, which is also three by three. So here, simply duplicating the column, copying the first column into the second and third column. So, and then this works. So element-wise uh, summation. Here's an example that will produce an error. So let's say you have an array three, uh, array A, sorry, which has, uh, which has a horizontal array of three elements and B has three uh, rows and two columns. And in this case, you have a mismatch because no matter if you follow these rules, you still cannot arrive at two arrays of the same size. So you'll get an error. So uh, when you try to do this in uh, NumPy, it will simply tell you, well, sorry, I can't, can't, uh, um, I can't um, um, translate these two arrays into the same shape. So cannot do this separation. So why, uh, why this broadcasting is important? Well, uh, here's an example. So in this case, I have uh, two, uh, it's essentially one dimensional arrays. So in the array of axis, so a link space in NumPy, as many of you already know, it simply gives you discretization uh, uh, from, from zero, in this case, from zero to five, I have 50 points. So it's, uh, I place 50 uniformly spaced points in the um, uniformly spaced points into the interval from zero to five. And it's a one, so X is a one dimensional array. So think of it as a horizontal array. And Y is also the same, uh, the same uh, size, 50 elements from zero to five, but it's a vertical array, right? So one is a horizontal, the other one is a vertical array. And then uh, when I perform a mathematical operation uh, that has both X and Y, uh, I simply, um, inside NumPy, uh, it follows the broadcasting rules and it forms a two dimensional, in this case, 50 by 50 array with the result of this operation. So doing something like this lets you easily construct a two dimensional uh, function. So Z is a two dimensional NumPy array and then you can plot it, right? So I say, simply say image, image shows Z and then I also add, add the color bar and it uh, simply plots this nice mathematical function. So uh, here I have uh, a 50 by 50 array. So 50 by 50 is, uh, 2,500. And so with a single line, I perform 2,500, uh, you know, uh, compute this function 2,500 times. But because I do all of this inside NumPy, this is much, much faster than doing two nested uh, for loops. So uh, that's all I wanted to say about uh, NumPy. We're not going to do any linear algebra today. So the point is that NumPy is really fast. And if you can use it, please use it because it'll uh, speed up your Python code by a large factor. And because NumPy is so efficient, uh, later on, so NumPy itself was first released in 2005, and since then, a lot of other uh, Python packages uh, were built on top of NumPy. So here are just some of the famous examples. I mean, there are, there are many, many, I can give you dozens of examples, but scikit-image is a collection of algorithms for image processing. 
And underneath, all images are stored as NumPy arrays. So you can actually type, you know, you have an image and so you say type and then this image, and I shall tell you that it's really a uh, NumPy array, excuse me. And so uh, it's a three-dimensional NumPy array uh, because we have width, height, and the third dimension is uh, four numbers. So it's uh, red, green, and blue filters, and then the alpha or the opacity channel. Many of you are familiar with Pandas. Uh, Pandas implements uh, two-dimensional, uh, two-dimensional, essentially uh, two-dimensional tables uh, using NumPy, and it provides very convenient operation, operations for working with these tables and for, uh, for visualization and for uh, doing I.O., for example, writing these tables to, uh, to disk. YT is another example. So YT is a package for working with uh, three-dimensional multi-resolution data. And here the idea is that if you're doing a, let's say an adaptive mesh refinement, AMI simulation, where you have uh, a, a volume with multiple uh, subgrades. So you place, you know, grades with, uh, of high resolution into uh, parts of the volume where, you know, in interesting things happen, for example, have galaxies forming or shock waves, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you can have a single variable, let's say temperature uh, that is defined on multiple grids in the same volume of different resolutions. And YT lets you actually work with such data set and manipulate this data very easily. So I gave a couple of years ago, I gave a couple of webinars on YT. If you're interested in this, uh, you can simply go to our, uh, to our training materials page. There is the, uh, there is the link at the bottom. And by, by the way, these slides that you see here, uh, you can actually download them. So at every, uh, on every slide, I have a link to uh, these slides, these various slides you see on your screen, and you can simply download them using this uh, bit.ly uh, bit link. And perhaps uh, if bit.ly doesn't work for some of you, Marie can actually paste into the chat the longer, uh, the longer copy of uh, this link. All right, so uh, let's jump into X-Ray because we already had a very long introduction. So X-Ray is a library for working with a multi-dimensional arrays. And essentially it brings the power of uh, NumPy and Pandas, so meaning easy data manipulation, uh, reading these arrays in, uh, to disk and writing these arrays to disk and plotting. So one dimensional, usually one dimensional and two dimensional plotting, uh, two multi-dimensional arrays. So it does not support multi-resolution data out of the box. For that, we'll need to use YT. But on the plus side, uh, with X-rays, uh, well, inside X-ray, you can work with arrays of any dimensionality. So it could be 3D, could be 2D, could be, you know, 100D, doesn't matter. So there is no hard-coded uh, limitation. And X-ray makes it really easy to work with time-dependent time arrays. So time is just going to be one of, you know, one of the dimensions. Uh, so inside X-ray, there are two main data structures. One is called data array, which is simply a fancy version of a NumPy array. You will see in a second why it's fancy, so what kind of stuff you can do. And then uh, when you have multiple uh, data arrays, you can uh, put them into a data set. And usually a data set is a collection of multiple uh, X-ray uh, data arrays that usually, but don't have to, share dimensions. So you will see many examples today. Uh, let's just start with a very simple example. So here we are coding a data array from scratch. So I'm importing the X-ray library as XR and NumPy as NP, and I form a data array, right? So this data uh, array function inside of XR forms, uh, creates a new uh, data array from scratch. So think of a data array is essentially a mathematical array. So in this case, we have an array of randoms. So the first argument is a NumPy array that contains the values. So this is an array of random numbers from zero to one that uh, has dimensionality uh, of four by three, so four rows and three columns. And then we supply dimensionality. So here, the second argument dims is uh, the list of the names uh, of the uh, coordinates. So I chose them to be uh, Y and X, but it could be, you know, radius, latitude, longitude, or anything, or time, or anything I want, right? These are just the names. Uh, and the reason why I have Y before X um, is because when we print this array to, uh, to the screen, I want Y to represent the uh, vertical uh, direction, so the rows, and then X is the columns. And then uh, the third argument here is uh, coordinates. So coordinates is basically discretization. So what I'm passing here is a Python dictionary uh, that contains um, a list of key value pairs. So uh, for each key is the name of the, uh, of the uh, uh, dimension, well, of the coordinate, right? So we have X and Y. And inside coordinates, the order is not important. So we have X and this is uh, discretization for X. So there are uh, three values, 10, 11, and 12. And then there are four values of Y, right? And on top of these uh, two-dimensional discretization, so we have two coordinates, we have this uh, two-dimensional four by three NumPy array. And then if we simply say print data, 
all we'll do, we'll just print all the information it has about the data array. So we'll say that there is a single uh, data array. Uh, this is, it's a data array. So these are its values. Uh, so for rows, three, three columns, and these guys, so the X array, it's a function of two independent coordinates, X with three values and Y four values. And then uh, the coordinates themselves are 64-bit uh, integers, and these are the values of the coordinates. So uh, I don't see any questions. So I hope this is uh, all very clear so far. So <clears throat> let's just print some basic information about this two-dimensional array. We can say data.dims. So dims is one of the attributes of this data object. I'll just tell you that there are two independent variables, y and x. Uh, we can type uh, print the size. So size uh, data dot size is the total number of elements. So for rows, three columns, 12 elements in total. We can print the type, it's uh, 464. So eight uh, byte, so double precision for each element. The, the coordinates will simply uh, print more information about the coordinates, so X and Y and uh, their discretization. You can access the specific coordinates by simply continuing on this notation, data coordinates, and then I uh, have the, uh, the, the, the square brackets and then supply the key for the coordinates, so X as a string variable. And that will simply uh, print uh, you know, everything it knows about these coordinates. So the output of this, this is important, is gonna be a data array, another data array, with uh, you know, all the information about discretization for the X coordinate. And if you wanna access a specific value, simply type uh, you know, another, uh, another square bracket, let's see value number one, which is the second value, and it's gonna be uh, equal to 11. So the output of this construct is still gonna be a data array, an X array data array. And if you wanna, uh, if you wanna convert it to, um, to a NumPy array, uh, in all these constructs, what you need to do is add dot values, and I'll just convert a data array into a NumPy array, so dot values. You'll see many examples uh, showing that. And then you can also use pandas-like notation, so you can say data and then dot x. So in pandas, you can say, uh, you know, the name of the pandas data frame and then dot the column name. So the same here, data dot and then the name of the variable, whether it's a coordinate variable or the actual, you know, NumPy array. And this notation is also possible. So in this case, we are getting one, one value. And as I mentioned for, if you apply dot values, they will simply return a sort of data array, like in all previous examples, it will output a NumPy array. So this guy is a one-dimensional NumPy array with three elements. So uh, you can also assign attributes. And attributes could be anything, uh, so you're allowed to use any source of attributes. So attributes internally are stored as a dictionary uh, that is, is associated with a data array. So in this case, I'm going to say data attributes, and then I'm going to say author and my initials, and then date, uh, today's date. But you know, these guys could be anything. It's just a you know a, a, a set of t-value pairs, so a dictionary, and then uh, we'll also. Um, is a separate uh, uh, separate L, uh, separate uh, key value pair. We're going to say name density. So then that's the name of the variable. Then units. So my density is going to be in grams per centimeter cube. And then I also assign separately attributes. Uh, so before I had attributes for the data array itself, and then I also assign attributes to the coordinates. So units for x and units for y are going to be centimeters. And now with these new attributes, I can simply type data dot attributes, and that will print all the top level attributes of this data array. And then uh, if you type uh, the array itself data, that will print all the information, including the top level attributes. But here you don't see centimeters. So centimeters are actual attributes of the coordinates. They don't appear in this uh, top level printout. So if you wanna see the attributes, let's say of X, the units uh, the centimeters, all you need to do is just type data.x and then it will print everything it knows, including the attributes of the uh, corresponding coordinate. So, so far, very simple. Subsetting arrays, uh, there are many different ways. So uh, one of the simplest one is just using, using the usual uh, Python square bracket notation. So because we have a two dimensional array, you can print uh, it's, let's see, this is the first row, right? So there are, there are two uh, dimensions and uh, zero means the first, so first row in this case, and then all elements in the second dimension. So this will print the first row. In this case, we're printing the uh, last two columns, so uh, all rows, and then the last two columns, so the usual Python uh, notation. In this case, we are replacing a the very last corner element, so last column and last row, with another value, so we can modify uh, an element of a data array in place, same as with NumPy arrays. And then uh, here the output is, uh, so in this case, the output is actually a NumPy array because we have dot values. And then I take this NumPy array and uh, um, print its first row, 
uh, yeah, print this first row, and uh, here we have all elements from uh, all columns from zero to, uh, to to the end. Actually, I don't really have to have the zero. I'm not sure why I have it, but it's kind of redundant here. So this is essentially uh, all rows. So in addition to using this uh, Python square bracket notation, you can use the built-in iCell function uh, to select by coordinate index. So I'll show you an example in the next slide cell function to select by coordinate value. And these two guys are actually very similar to pandas lock and iLock functions, those of you familiar with pandas. And then you can also do one dimensional and two or multidimensional interpolation as well. So let me show you a few examples. Uh, data iCell itself, if you, it's a function. And if you don't provide any arguments, then it, the result is the same as data. So it means no selection, just return the original data array. And optionally, you can refine your selection by passing any number of arguments. For example, in this case, we're passing a single argument. So in this case, I shall remember it, you need to pass an index, not a value, but an index. So y equal to one simply returns the second row, right? Uh, in, uh, uh, in, in this case, we have I shall y equal to one. So exactly the same expression. I'm just typing, is, um, uh, printing its type and it says that the output is data array. So when you do this selection, I shall or shall, or interpolation, the result, even if it's a single number, the result is always going to be another data array. So in this case, I'm just returning the second row. Right? So here's an example where I pass uh, two, um, two arguments uh, to the uh, selection. So in here, I'm returning, returning the first row, y equal to zero. And then here, I'm actually passing uh, two indices for x uh, as a list, right? So that means the second to the last and the last column. So returning the first row, and last two columns of the array. So in this case, we're actually using this uh, list notation to request two, two different columns. And in this case, um, oh, I'm, I'm using the same, yeah, I'm using the same, uh, the same selection. I'm just converting this uh, from uh, a NumPy, sorry, from a data array to a NumPy array with, by using the dot values notation. So uh, if you want to uh, select by the coordinate value, not by the index, by the value, then you have to use the cell function. And uh, the selection function, it's a little bit tricky. So when you have uh, integer values for the coordinates, then everything is easy, like in this slide. But later on, I'm going to show you an example where it actually breaks. When you try to work with floating values of the coordinate, then things will become slightly more complex. But this is for another slide. So here, I'm simply uh, type, printing the type of the x coordinate. It says that it's a 64-bit integer. And so these are the values, uh, three different um, uh, values of the x coordinate. And then I can simply select by the value. So not i cell, but this time cell, and simply pass your selection. So print all values of the data array at x equal to 10. So that returns a one-dimensional array, right? And then uh, data dot y, uh, so it gives us uh, four values of, there are four values of the uh, y uh, coordinate. And then here, uh, data selection, I'm simply refining, so adding yet another argument. I'm simply uh, printing everything that matches x equal to 10, and then y has two different values, right? So a single row and then two, uh, actually, sorry, a single column and then two different rows. So the result is uh, two, two numbers. And uh, another way of uh, subsetting a range is by applying the slice function. So y equal to slice from 15 to 30, what it does, it will simply include all rows or all values of y that fall into this uh, closed range. So everything from 15 to 30 inclusive, all rows um, will be included. So in this case, we have we have two rows, 20 and 30, because we have this registration for y, 10, 20, 30, and 40. And these two guys, 20 and 30, fall into this slice, right? So three, val th three different ways of um, uh, doing selection. So you can pass a value, you can pass a list of values, or you can pass a, a range by using the slice function. All right, and then interpolation is just used to interpolate by coordinate values. So uh, the notation is exactly the same. So here's our data array. And let's say you want to interpolate between the first and the second rows. So uh, the first two rows are 10 and 20. And I'm going to just um, say, um, sorry, uh, the first two rows, yeah, 10 and 20. And I'm going to say y is equal to 15. So this is right uh, between the first and the second rows. And then the first two columns are 10 and 11. And I'm going to say x is equal to 10.5. So here we have a two-dimensional interpolation and it works just nicely. The default method is a linear interpolation. I believe for two-dimensional interpolation in the next array, you have uh, only selection of the closest neighbor 
or linear interpolation, but for one-dimensional interpolation, there is a bunch of other methods like cubic interpolation, et cetera, et cetera. So in this case, uh, I'm specifying the method nearest interpolation, and here it's actually not performing interpolation, it just picks up the value from the nearest uh, neighbor, which is, which is this guy. And then uh, here is a one-dimensional interpolation. So here I'm saying uh, interpolate and just select the value of y. And then the output is going to be uh, a, 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 um, a row, right? So uh, a, a one-dimensional ray between the first and the second rows. All right. You can also have aggregate functions. So aggregate functions, uh, you know, things like mean, uh, standard deviation, uh, sum, et cetera, et cetera. So mean max, obviously. Uh, so all of these uh, take in a number of um, dimensions. So either one dimension, well, actually no dimensions you, you can also use, or some number of dimensions. And then we'll simply calculate an aggregate function uh, over those dimensions. So for example, apply mean over y, that will return a one-dimensional array, so mean of each column. Or you can uh, say spatial mean, so the total mean. So this guy in second row, we're computing the mean uh, in both the x and y uh, coordinates, uh, that is exactly the same as, you know, this spatial mean where you're simply computing mean as so a single value for the entire two-dimensional array. So uh, notice this, when I print a mean of each column, it outputs this array. Uh, so just memorize these numbers because we'll see them in the next slide. So uh, there's also a useful function group by that lets you take your, uh, uh, your multi-dimensional data array and uh, and uh, group it into, well, uh, divide it into groups by, by an attribute. So for example, an attribute could be a coordinate. So here we are, have three different values of X and we simply say group by X. So it, uh, it uh, breaks this into three, essential three data arrays and each array has a fixed value of X. And why do you wanna do that is because you can apply a function separately to each group. For example, here I'm going to say a lambda function. So for each, um, so for each value, so here v, v is just a variable. But essentially, what it means is, uh, for each uh, for each element, uh, replace this element with the following expression. So what this means is uh, this function is going to be applied separately to each group. So a group in our case is a column because we group by the column. And uh, what I will do is in each column, we'll simply compute the sum of all elements and then divide by the number of elements. So that will essentially compute the mean of each element, right? And the output, as you can see, is very similar to, well, it's exactly equivalent to the output from the previous slide where we were computing the mean of each column. And so this is really convenient if you want, you know, apply some more complex um, data, use some more complex data manipulation. For example, you can normalize data separately in each column, right? So I use the vmin, vmax. So these functions are applied to each uh, each column uh, independently. So I'm just normalizing data in each column separately for that individually for that column. All right. So plotting is also built into X-ray. So this is done by matplotlib underneath um, X-ray. And uh, the interface is really convenient. So you don't have to think any about anything. When you have a data array, let's say if it's two-dimensional array, all you need to do is just say data array and then dot plot. And then option can pass some number of arguments, you know, color map, size, et cetera, et cetera. So size here refers to the size of the figure, right? So it just gives you a bigger figure. And when you do this data plot, it will simply uh, plot the two-dimensional array. So you don't have to do anything else if you're working inside a Jupyter notebook. So if you're working inside a Python script or in a Python shell, not inside Jupyter notebook, then uh, there are two lines that you need to use here. Uh, so you need to also uh, use the show function to actually display your plot uh, as a separate window if you're working, let's say, from a Python shell. But if you're working inside Jupyter Notebook, you don't really, you don't need the, the last two commands. So uh, the first command is all that is needed for X-ray, plotting an X-ray inside, uh, uh, inside a Jupyter Notebook. So if you have a one-dimensional data array, so in this case, we have to start with a two-dimensional data array, and then we select uh, the uh, first row, right? So this is selecting the first row, and then we'll simply plot it. We say that each dot is gonna be uh, plotted as a circle marker. Uh, that's the size of the uh, plot itself. And then marker size is six, so the size of individual dots. And because now we have a two-dimensional object, it simply plots it as a line, which is really great. So you don't really even have to think about, you know, what kind of plot you get. Uh, X-ray will try to uh, produce the, you know, the right plot for, uh, for whatever data array you're, you're, you're passing to the plotting function. So uh, here's an example of a three-dimensional data array. And uh, I see it's already, we already have 20 minutes left. So I try to uh, go a little bit faster and perhaps I'll skip some things. So here we're creating a uh, three-dimensional array. So X, Y, Z inside a unit cube zero to one 
on a 50 cube uh, Cartesian mesh. And here I'm just using the same notation you saw before. So lean space plays 50 points in the interval from zero to one for X, Y, and Z. So X is a row uh, vector, Y is a column vector, and then Z is a vector, think of it as a vector going into, into well, perpendicular to the plane of your screen. And then of these we form two functions. So F1, which is function at one side of the cube. And then uh, we have a function that is rotated 90 degrees. So here I'm simply for F2, I'm taking the expression for F1 and then I switch uh, X and Y, the positions for X, Y. So essentially this is spinning the image by 90 degrees. And then I'm forming these um, uh, three-dimensional functions. So F is gonna be uh, in a, a NumPy array of 50 by 50 by 50 elements using the broadcasting rules. And then I simply use it to form these uh, data uh, X-ray data array where dimensions are Z, Y, and X. The coordinates are, are these guys, right? So here I have Z, Y, and X. And one thing that you need to do here, you need to pass the one dimensional uh, discretizations here. So I'm saying Z flatten, and that produces instead of this, you know, uh, this array perpendicular to the screen, it produces a simple one dimensional array. So here I have a simple one dimensional array, and here I have a simple one dimensional array. And then I can simply plot this. So here the interesting thing is that now uh, row is a three dimensional array. Right, so uh, here's my row. It's a three-dimensional not, uh, not numpy uh, data array, right? And then when I try to plot it, so if I try to, so in this case, I'm selecting uh, the uh, two, uh, two slices. So Z equal to zero, one side of the cube, and then the other Z equal to one, the other side of the cube. And then uh, the result of this selection is also a three-dimensional array. So this guy is a three-dimensional array. And then when I try to plot it, the problem is that I have a two-dimensional screen, right? So, and I'm doing this in my lip. So what uh, X-ray will do, it will simply produce a histogram of all values in my three-dimensional array, which is not particularly useful to me because I want to see what the array looks like, what the function looks like. What I can do is I can actually plot it, plot this three-dimensional object, but then I can uh, span it by, uh, by so columns, uh, the columns. So you'll produce two images and uh, the, these two images will represent the third dimension. So I have two, uh, two slices. And then uh, the first image was going to be uh, the first slice, and the second image is going to be the second slice. So all you need to do if you're writing, working with X-ray inside Jupyter Notebook is just issue this line, and it produced these two images. Right? And then, of course, uh, you can write an X-ray to this. There is a default, um, the most commonly used function is, uh, well, file format for X-ray is NetCDF, which is fantastic format uh, designed specifically for working with uh, what well, storing multi-dimensional arrays on this and that will simply write this multi-dimensional array into into this uh, this this um, uh, file so let me actually already uh, uh, run this code I have this file row.nc and let me just show so I'm gonna uh, load this file into prior view which is a three-dimensional oops which is a three-dimensional uh, visualization program so uh, just bear with me let me just switch windows so what I'm going to do is uh, inside this uh, general purpose plotting uh, uh, package per review, I'm just going to load this row.nc guy, NetCDF file. And then I just want to show you what it looks like. So here we apply it. And uh, then I'm going to look at the outer surface and then plot it by the function, by my X-ray. And here's my three-dimensional uh, three data cube. So as you can see, I see those two functions that I saw before in Matplotlib, and now you see this as a, as a three-dimensional function, right? All right, so uh, let me switch back to the slides. I don't see any questions. Are there any questions at this point? If not, then let's continue. So a data set, is a collection of multiple uh, data arrays that usually share dimensions. So let's start with an existing code for the uh, row data array from the previous slide. So here we have in the dark box, we have the code copied from the previous, uh, from the previous uh, slides. And then, so we have the row data array, and then uh, it contains a real three-dimensional function. And also we have this um, data array containing, so it's the same dimensionality Z, Y, and X, the same discretization, 50 by 50 by 50 Cartesian mesh. And then here we have for the values, we simply use a uh, two-dimensional, sorry, three-dimensional uh, random uh, array drawn, for, uh, drawn from a standard normal distribution. So essentially it's a 50 uh, cube uh, 
uh, number of random points that are centered uh, on, on 20. So it's going to be kind of a temperature, right, in Celsius. And then we take uh, two, uh, these two three-dimensional arrays, rho, density, and temperature, and we put them into a data set. So in our case, data set has three, uh, sorry, has four uh, variables for data arrays. So temperature is the values are taken from temperature, from this temperature data array. Uh, density, something called density, and the values are taken from this rho uh, density, uh, sorry, row uh, data array. And then we add to uh, two other arrays. So this guy bar is a one dimensional array. And I included his here simply because to show that it's possible have, you know, an array of another um, dimensionality inside the same data set. So in this case, n is equal to 50. So it's a 50 dimensional array that is function of x. So in fact, I'm see here specifically saying that bar, my one dimensional array is going to be a function of x. And here I must provide a NumPy array, so these are the 50 values of bar that has the same dimensionality as, as x, otherwise you will get an error message. And then pi is uh, just a single value, a scalar uh, you know, value of pi, mathematical pi, that is also uh, a, uh, once I initialize this, you will see that this is gonna be a data array with a single scalar, uh, scalar value. So now we print this data, uh, data set, and you see it prints basically everything inside the data set. So it says there are these four variables, temperature, uh, density, bar and pi, and um, temperature and density are functions of z, y, and x, they're three-dimensional variables, and then bar is a one-dimensional variable, it's a function of x only, and then pi is just a scalar number, right, and these are discretizations of x, y, and z, and these are, you know, so we have 50, uh, 50 by 50 by 50 uh, uh, three-dimensional mesh. So now if you <clears throat> want to print the variable, there are many ways of doing that, you can say ds.density or ds.temperature, and then I'm simply printing, printing its shape. So this is gonna be a, a three-dimensional array, right? And shape of it, of, of it is uh, 50 by 50 by 50. Another way to access variable is using this notation, data those variables, and then you can pass, um, uh, you know, dictionary like um, format, uh, you can pass the, uh, the, uh, the key, which is gonna be the name of your variable. And then if you type dot shape, it's gonna return exactly the same uh, triplet. So 50 by 50 by 50. Array. So you can also print the coordinates, you know, or do all, all the usual things. So uh, selecting floating values, this is something that you have to be careful when you work with data arrays. When your uh, coordinates are not integers, but floating point numbers, you might run into problems with uh, selection. So in this case, uh, let's print the values of the X coordinate, ds.x, and this produces this one dimensional uh, data array, right? So these are the values of X. So this is the, uh, the zero, well, the first value, index zero, this is the second value, index one. Uh, let's just print it. So print the, uh, the second value is this guy, right? This guy. And then uh, let's try uh, using selection function uh, by passing the exact value of my X coordinate, right? I'm just copying this value in here and I'm hoping to get you know, the selection. And most likely this will fail. This will actually produce an error message and also a key error. And, but basically what it means is that it cannot find that value of X. So what is the problem here? Well, the problem is that you're trying to uh, use a conditional for an approximate value. Well, think of uh, floating numbers as approximate numbers, right? So they're represented approximately inside the computer. And, um, and uh, there are actually probably some number of uh, decimal points that are not printed here. And, uh, uh, and uh, when you try to apply a conditional, just find the value of X equal to this value. Uh, in you know, machine precision, uh, well, in, in, in memory, this number is probably stored to, to some other precision and then you'll get a mismatch. So basically it cannot find this value of X. So how do you deal with this problem? Well, uh, one, one thing is you can actually pass not the numerical, you know, paste numerical value, but just take the value from the, uh, from the variable itself. So DS X of one, and that gives you the exact value uh, stored in machine memory and that will work, but probably a better a uh, better solution is just to, instead of using the cell function, use the I cell function, right? Because you want to have the value with the index of one or simply use the range. So the slice function, specify a range and then it'll print back everything falling uh, inside that range of the X coordinate. So if we see this file cube, sorry, at least um, data set now it has uh, four variables. So remember it has density, temperature, bar, and then pi, mathematical pi. Uh, let's just store it into file uh, internet CDF file uh, called cube.nc. And again, everything is done with uh, you know, a single line. So name of data set dot to net CDF function, and then you supply the file name. 
And then uh, let's just try to load this file into Prairie View. So the file is cube.nc and, and see what happens. So let me just uh, disconnect from the server and then do from scratch. So the file is uh, cube.nc, that's cube.nc in the same directory. And uh, here I'm using the netcdf reader. And so now what I need to do is, because I have a bunch of variables with different dimensionality, so there's something that depends only on x, something, so that is the bar variable, something that does not depend on any variable, so that's mathematical pi, and then there is something that depends on z, y, and x. So these are my uh, two three-dimensional arrays, temperature and pressure. So if I load these guys, uh, now I look at the outer surface and then I color by, now I can color by density or temperature, right? So not pressure, but temperature. So uh, my density is the same three-dimensional function you saw before. And uh, temperature is a random function. Remember, it's a random function that is centered on 20 degrees, right? And it's just, uh, it's just you know, standard drawn from a standard normal distribution centered on 20 degrees. So we get a bunch of random numbers filling the three-dimensional Cartesian mesh. So the point here is that you can put a bunch of, a number of uh, data arrays into a single data set, and these data arrays can share the grid, but they don't have to. So that can actually depend on uh, different coordinates. So uh, if you wanna, so so far we've been writing, we wrote two files to disk and both of them were um, written in uh, double precision, which is not particularly uh, you know, good if you're trying to save on disk space. So if your variables are not very large or very small, then you probably wanna save them as single precision and that will just give you, you know, twice as efficient disk storage. So four bytes per number as opposed to eight bytes per number. And so if you wanna save a data set in single precision, what you need to do is you need to initialize a data set in single precision. So your variables have to, your data arrays have to be in single precision. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm just modifying the previous example where my uh, X, Y, and Z arrays are gonna be NumPy arrays of single precision. So by default, NumPy will give you double, uh, double precision for floating variables, but you don't have to use a double precision, you can switch to single precision. So F1, F2, will become single precision. So F1 and F2 are two-dimensional single precision arrays. F uh, is gonna be a single precision three-dimensional array. And then uh, I'm simply uh, initializing here row and temperature. So temperature is, is also a single precision array. Row is single precision because it's based of on F, which is a single precision NumPy array. And then I initialize this uh, same data set where everything is a single precision. So you can see by is single precision. And just for you know the kick of it, uh, pi is single precision as well. And then when I save this file to disk, you'll actually see that this file is, uh, so I'm saving it as cube single precision dot nc. And if you check the um, file size, you see that it's exactly one half of the size of the previous cube dot nc file. And if you print the type of all the data arrays explicitly, d, d type um, attribute, you will see that all of them, all these guys are uh, flow 32, so they are single precision. So now, so far we've been working only with uh, data sets stored on a Cartesian, uh, Cartesian mesh, whether it's two dimensional, three dimensional. Uh, you can actually work with, um, any sort of, uh, you know, uh, regular, uh, uh, any sort of um, uh, multidimensional grid, as, as long as, as it has regular topologies, for example, a, um, a spherical mesh or a cylindrical mesh. So here's an example uh, where I have a data set that is stored on a uh, three-dimensional uh, spherical mesh. So um, instead of now having X, Y, and Z, I have three coordinates, latitude, longitude, and radius. And the exact name is actually not important, so you can have something else. The important thing is, uh, it's, it's not really obvious, but the important thing is when you store this file, when you initialize this data array, you have to supply the unit's attributes for latitude for two of your dimensions. So for example, latitude and longitude as degrees north and degrees east. And as long as uh, these guys appear in your data set and you save this data set to a file, you will see that when you load this function into, let's say, Paraview or Visit or into, you know, another general purpose uh, 3D visualization tool, your data set will display it in spherical geometry. And the reason for this is because, so an etcd file itself is just a container for, which is a file for storing three-dimensional array, well, multi-dimensional arrays. But then um, there are also what is called climate and forecast conventions uh, that uh, have, basically it's a convention for, uh, you know, the format in which you store these uh, three-dimensional arrays. You're also supplying one-dimensional array, so discretization, let's say elevation or radius in latitude and longitude and the units, so these attributes, degrees north and degrees east, and then uh, these adheres to the uh, CF climate and forecast, con uh, forecast net CDF convention, and then uh, all other programs where uh, in which you read this data set, 
will interpret it as you know geophysical or oceanography or atmospheric data in this um, uh, climate and forecast convention. So here I save the file into uh, this data set into a spherical dotency file, where what I'm doing is I have uh, let's see. So here I have f three dimensional function which has some weak dependence on longitude and strong dependence on latitude and is proportional to radius. And then I simply uh, store it in the spherical.nc file. So let me load this file spherical.nc into Paraview. So I'm going to say uh, file open, uh, spherical.nc, and it's this guy, so that's CDF freedom. And then, so one thing that I have to be uh, conscious of uh, before I hit apply, I need to pay attention to the dimensionality. So it actually picks the right dimension. So here's grayed out. So I don't, I don't have an option to change it, but it says radius, longitude, latitude. And uh, the spherical coordinates box is, box is checked automatically. So that means that it understood it as a spherical uh, mesh. So if I say apply, and now let me switch to a surface view and then go to color by density. So here's my density distribution. As you can see, I have kind of two polar caps in my uh, three-dimensional function. And it's in fact a three-dimensional function. So go to information, you'll see that it's a function of three coordinates. So it's a function of, uh, let's see, actually it says X, Y, Z, but it's a three-dimensional data set. So it doesn't show uh, latitude, longitude, and radius. But if I dissect it, you will see that it's three-dimensional uh, data set. So I apply a cliff filter and uh, let me just show you just a second. So here we go. And you see that it's really a three-dimensional data set, right? So here we go. All right. So going back to the slides, uh, we are getting very close to the end. So time series data, one of the mentions could be uh, could be time. So because time has you know dates and well uh, days and months etc cetera, etc, cetera, uh, it's uh, really. Um, you can work with time just as a floating number, but it's very convenient to have you know, dates, hours, et cetera, et cetera. And for that, uh, X-ray relies on pandas uh, functions for a time series um, representation. So for example, there is a, inside pandas, there is date range function where you specify one date uh, and then the frequency and number of periods and simply fills in uh, your, uh, it creates this um, time uh, pandas data array. Uh, that contains time. And if you print it, it will say, say that it's time. In this case, we're going from January 1st, 2000 in, uh, so we have uh, this number of, um, this number of entries uh, on a daily, uh, daily uh, frequency. And that simply gives you uh, three years filled with uh, dates from uh, January 1st, 2000 until uh, December 31st, 2002. So there are, there are three years here and then there's one leap year. And then um, there are a bunch of you know things you can um, you can you can print. For example, if say time dot month, this will actually produce another array of the same uh, length. But each element instead of the date string date, you will have the month. So we have January, then February, and so on, and then December of the third year. If we say time dot day, it will just replace the you know each element with the corresponding day of the month, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, Here's an example of a time dependent data set. We have just, uh, so not a, a, in the re, I just have a scalar, scalar field. So I call it temperature. And temperature is, so in this case, it's a one dimensional uh, NumPy array, which is a function of time. So time is number of days in three years from uh, beginning of 2000 until the end of 2002. And then uh, this is a one dimensional, temperature is a one dimensional NumPy array. And then I'm forming a data set of temperature that is a function of only time. So it's think of it as a scalar variable temperature that is, uh, is time dependent, right? And then we simply plot it. So if I see um, uh, temperature, so data set dot temperature dot plot, uh, it will simply plot my temperature. So here I'm uh, mimicking the, uh, the uh, seasonal variation. And then I simply uh, pass it to the plotting function and then X-ray will figure out that you have a one dimensional object. So temperature as a function of time, and then it will just plot it. So, oops, sorry. And then if I simply uh, print the uh, data, uh, data set itself, it will, you know, tell you what, what's inside of this data set. So it'll tell you there's a single variable called temperature as a function of time. These are the values of temperature, and these are the values of, of time, so the dates. Uh, time subsetting, so I'll skip that, but uh, for time subsetting, just use the same, uh, you know, I cell cell uh, functions and uh, you can play with dates. So there are, you know, different things you can do. So in this case, for example, I simply resample uh, to uh, one point per week. So time is a seven day interval and uh, then it's gonna, you know, look more, uh, well, look, look smoother. 
the one dimensional plot. And then it's very easy to make a three dimensional data set. So uh, because we are running out of time, I have only three minutes, uh, I'm gonna switch to the very last slide. So Earth's mantle convection, because this is uh, actually, uh, uh, it's related to, uh, so this guy is important because it's related to an upcom upcoming uh, scientific visualization competition that we're gonna announce in Compute Canada towards the end of October. So the idea is that we're opening a competition that anybody can participate in. So you don't have to be associated with university. And uh, it will be announced. Uh, so keep an eye on, uh, on our Westgrid emails and on our website, uh, westgrid.ca. So the data set is actually simulation of Earth's mantle convection and data courtesy of um, the research group from the University of Toronto. And um, it's a three-dimensional data set where each time step was saved into a, uh, into a separate uh, NetCDF file. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna show you a very quick demo of loading this into, so here I have a, uh, my temperature. So I'm just gonna start Python and then I'm gonna be copying and pasting uh, lines to save on time. So I'm porting X-ray library and then I'm reading my data set from this file. So this is the very first time step. And then this read into this data set data, right? Which is just a, an X-ray data set that has a number of variables. So there are, uh, there are actually eight variables, so temperature and a bunch of other three-dimensional fields. There are also uh, three um, uh, spatial components of Cartesian components of velocity, Vx, Vy, and Vz. And all of these guys are depend on latitude, radius, and longitude. So there are, uh, these are discretizations for, uh, for, these, um, for these coordinates. And in fact, there are, as you can see, it's, it's discretized at a one degree resolution. So it's numerical simulation at one degree resolution. And then there are 201 uh, values of the radius. And then if you're, you want to print data, you can simply access individual fields by using these dot notations. For example, if I want to print temperature, well, here's my temperature. If I just say data temperature, it will give me the, uh, the data array. If I want to convert it to a NumPy array, well, really easy to do. I just type dot values and that's going to result in a NumPy array. If I want to see, you know, for example, uh, oh, let's see what else I have density. Oh, it doesn't expand. So I can type data dot variables and uh, that will show me a list of variables and, uh, you know, there's a density anomaly, et cetera, et cetera. So last thing I want to show you is let me just open this file inside Paraview and show you what it looks like. So I could read this file, this real data set, real simulation data set using X-ray fu uh, um, functions. And then I'm just gonna show you what it looks like in Paraview. So inside Paraview, uh, let me just have it, uh, sorry. It's under temp and then spherical, this guy. It's an SCDF file. And then uh, what I need to do is actually, yeah, everything is right here. So I say apply. And uh, let me resize my Paraview. It's taking a little bit longer to read because I'm running v uh, Zoom, sorry, a Zoom video at the same time. So here I'm gonna to switch to service view. And then uh, here I get my uh, 3D uh, sphere. And then uh, let me actually apply a clip filter, but for the clip type, uh, I'm gonna use not a plane, but a box. And then I'm gonna position this box at zero, zero, zero. And I'm gonna hit apply. And uh, takes a little bit longer than usual. Oh, I need to unshow the box and then invert the selection. Hit applying in. And just a second. I realize we are out of time. So yeah, this is the last thing I'm trying to show. And I just probably is a little bit slow because uh, I'm running video at the same time. All right, so here we go. And then let me spin it a little bit and then let's just display it uh, as colored by, by temperature. So here we go. So here the point is that actually this data set was created. So I took the data from the simulation data and then I wrote it to NetCDF using X-ray and then I, uh, I, I read it in this case in Paraview and you see it's a nice three-dimensional data set showing the real uh, simulation data. So you can actually see convection. If you play it back in time, if you load multiple um, multiple such files, this is just single time step. But if you load multiple time step, you can actually play it back and see you know, the convection uh, the convection uh, going inside the Earth's mantle. So uh, that's it. Uh, that's all I wanted to show. And um, if there are any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or type a question into the 
chat window and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. And again, this, is, well, this was really introductory, so I didn't talk about some other things. Uh, so for example, in X-Ray, X-Ray is actually underneath, it can use um, the Dusk library for multi-core processing. So if you have a uh, desktop that has uh, multiple uh, CPUs, multiple CPU cores, then underneath X-Ray will actually run in parallel. And that is great because uh, you can use multiple cores on the same machine. So any questions, uh, let me know. And then, uh, yeah, so the slides are available at this link right here at the bottom. And then, um, yeah, also um, my email address is at the first slide or there's also email address mentioned in the second slide. So training at westgrid.c. If you have any questions in the future, uh, anything related to, you know, X-ray or NetCDF or, uh, you know, Paraview, for example, or visualizing these X-rays, uh, uh, X-ray data sets, uh, just feel free to send me an email at any time. So thanks everybody. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks. So uh, our next, um, next webinar is gonna be on, uh, I believe, Marie, I believe if I'm not mistaken, uh, is gonna be on uh, using online resources to get help in any programming language, if I'm not mistaken. All right, well, thanks everybody. I don't see any questions, so uh, I assume there are none. And uh, this talk was recorded, so let me stop the recording.